Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to New York and hope you had a great weekend. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, one of us can please lead in prayer. Charles Kennedy, anyone? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a new day. We thank you so much for a new morning, but also a new week. Lord, this is our our day too for most of us who are near the East. Lord, we thank you that we are set to study. And that, Lord, I pray that you will connect the three of us, you, us, and our teacher, that we will be able to learn, for we are going to purposefully give our lives, our time, and our intentions to study your word from the book of Corinthians. Lord, I pray that you will give our lecturer the right words, that is the vocabulary, that we will be able to learn it, and that even the gadgets, the computers, the phones will be charged and the internet connection will also be available that all in all will be able to get what you purpose us to learn so that we shall establish your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Charles. All right. So last class, we looked at something very important uh, from 1 Corinthians. Uh, we looked at chapter 5, and then we also started chapter 6. Uh, now, chapter 5 was... Uh, a hard chapter, right? Uh, Paul is, uh, you know, writing to the church, the leaders, and saying, "Look, there's a there's a person in the church who's living a sexually immoral life, but as leaders in the church, you are tolerating it, right?" And and then he goes on to say, "Expel that immoral person out of the church. Why? So that there will be reconciliation." Right? And uh, in a way that he's taken out of, you know, we looked at that verse where he says, hand him over to Satan. Uh, and so we looked at what that really means. It means uh, Paul is not saying, you know, um, let him just die and go to hell or uh, condemning the, uh, the, uh, the person, but he's condemning the act of sexual immorality. And he's saying, take him out of the church, out of the covering, the spiritual protection of the church leaders and the church. Uh, yet, Paul says, so that he will come to his senses and he will change and his soul uh, uh, will be saved, right? So he also says, why to expel that immoral brother, right? Because uh, we looked at that, right? One person uh, who is living in continual sin and without a heart of repentance, uh, that person can affect the entire church. So the Apostle Paul is looking at the bigger picture. He's saying, okay, the church is more important. Uh, and, and so I have to protect the church rather than, you know, uh, let this man or woman continue in that sin and we are not seeing any change in that person. So it is a hard chapter. Uh, yet we also saw that you know the apostle Paul was uh, the one who spoke mostly about the grace of God, right? Uh, it looks like he is very stern here, uh, but we know that apostle Paul was a gracious man. He talked about the grace of God, uh, but the grace of God is not to be used loosely, um, and so he says to the church leaders, "Expel him out, uh, so that the church is not affected." Uh, and then finally, the person must be saved and the Lord will work in his life in, 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 in a different way. And then we looked at chapter 6. Chapter 6, he goes to the third problem. What is the third problem? Believers within the church, they have misunderstandings and fighting with each other. Right? Now, we must understand that we all are people with different temperaments. Uh, different lifestyles, different uh, cultures. When we come together, we have, uh, we, we are people, right? We are different. Um, but here, what's happening is, you know, we will have misunderstandings between us, right? I'm sure as believers, we all have misunderstandings with other believers, right? 
But in the church in Corinth, when these misunderstandings are happening and quarrels between believers, they are taking it to the court. And so Paul is sternly uh, you know, uh, talking to the church and he's saying, isn't there anyone, any leader in the church who is able to handle your problems? Why is it that you're taking your misunderstandings and your problems to the court? And then we also looked at why Paul was so serious about it. He said, see, you're going to stand in front of the court, the bima seat, the judgment seat, which is in the open place. And uh, it is a place where people come because, you know, two, two individuals are quarreling or fighting with each other. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an entertainment. Right? And everyone are looking, everyone are watching. Maybe people are mocking and criticizing. So the Apostle Paul is saying, because of this, the testimony of the believers, the testimony of the church is being affected. Right? So in chapter 6, he's listing out why these, you know, uh, these misunderstandings must be you know, resolved within the church and not to be taken out uh, into the court. Right? So uh, let me just project the notes. Right, so we stopped at verse 15, and uh, we'll begin from there, right? Where verse 14 is where we stop. So uh, verse 15, okay. So do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. So Paul is... Now he's moving in from the lawsuit, he's gone into sexual immorality, right? So from verse 12, he talks about sexual immorality. And so he says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Now you see how Paul is again dealing with this problem. See, in verse 5, he talked about the sexually immoral brother. He says, get him out of the church because this is what it is. And then he's talking about sexual immorality and he's informing the church why is it wrong, right? Because remember, for the Corinthians, it was a natural thing, right? It was it was common to be married and to you know have a prostitute in the uh, as well. So it was common. It was not a big uh, you know. Uh, right now, it's a big deal, but during those days, it wasn't a big deal. Right? So now Paul is trying to uh, you know encourage and exhort the believers to understand why this sexual morality is wrong right and he says the word members your bodies are members of Christ so the Greek word is melos which means uh, uh, meaning a limb or a part of the body and the word harlot is for name meaning prostitute so Paul is saying can I as as a child of God I am I, I am the temple of God. Can I involve myself with a prostitute? No, because if I do, then I am emotionally joined with that person and I become sexually immortal. Right? Uh, and, and so you and I must see our bodies as holy because of what Christ did for us. Right? Uh, because of Christ's work on the cross. Uh, and and our bodies are for Christ and Christ for our body. Right? It goes on verse 16 and 17. Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined with the Lord is in one spirit with him. Right? So in some way or the other, there is a joining together of two people in any sexual relationship, right? Now, this joining together can be, will be a spiritual, emotional, and moral in nature, right? So when a married couple are sexually involved, it's under uh, God's, you know, blessings. It's under God's jurisdiction. But when a man or a woman involved in sexual immorality outside of the marriage, 
this is serious because you're partaking in something which is not in you know not involved with the body of christ right and what happens they are under the judgment of god so paul is saying if you involve in that not only is your body and your 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 emotion your nature uh, destroyed but more than that you are under god's judgment right? god god is serious about this right now maybe some of us or you know as christians uh, we may we may not be involved in sexual immorality right or you know in prostit in prostitution or anything else but but the the lord jesus he he you know he says this when a man or a woman looks at the other person in a lustful way they've already committed sin in their heart so the old testament had certain guidelines right? don't involve in it but the lord jesus he raised the standard and he said it's not only about the act but it's also about thinking and looking at it that you have already uh, committed immorality verse 17 he says but he who is joined to the lord is one with spirit one spirit with him right so think of these ramifications of being spiritually one with the lord right uh, we are in him and he is in us our spiritual identity is in him and his life is in us right uh, john 1 john 4 17 says as he is so are we in this world as he is so are we in this world right? so remember your identity right? we are in him he is in us and his life is in us so the apostle paul is trying to say if his life is in us how can we take this this life that he has given us the members of uh, the body of christ and you know use it for sexual immorality it cannot be done it's just, it, it, it's it's like saying jesus i don't want you in my life uh, but i'd rather choose the things of the flesh it's a willful sin right? and so the lord says paul is saying you'll come under god's judgment right god's grace is there but there's also god's judgment right Verse 18, he says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does outside of the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. I like the word flee, right? The Greek word there, fugo. But what does it say? Flee is to escape, to vanish, to, to, to fly away, right? To flee. Yeah. The Apostle Peter also says that, right? Remember? And, he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Flee means to, to run away in haste, right? To escape quickly. Right? So if you picture this, right? Uh, if there's a thief right? uh, and he sees the police coming, right? uh, what is he going to do? He's not going to linger around there. Right? He's not going to say, okay, let them come. I still have some time. No. He's going to flee from that scene right away. Right? And Paul is saying here, flee from all sexual immorality. Right? When we have the slightest inclination or temptation, which is, could be of sexual sin, run away. Don't stop, think, ponder. But first run, then think. And that is what Joseph did, right? Remember Joseph? He, he just ran away. He did not want to defile his body because he knew that he belonged to God. He knew he had to keep himself holy uh, because he's God's child. And this must, this must be the stance that you and I also must take, right? It, it could be something very small. It could be, you know, watching something on the phone or or uh, you know even you know there are times when 
you know, as friends, you may be talking and people may be talking things that are not pleasing in God's eyes. Just flee from them, just move away, step away from it. It may look weird, and they may ask you, why did you go? But what you're doing is you're, you're saying, no, I'm going to protect myself from the things of the enemy, right? Uh, and sex outside of marriage, it might appear exciting, but it's enslaving, it's destructing, it's troubling, right? And over the course of many years, I have met with many people who had all they had, all they need in as a family, beautiful children, right? Wonderful home, uh, good parents, good schools, the children are going to, children are very good in their studies, everything looks right, but there's this problem. Right? And there are times marriages have broken, families have broken, uh, and it's so serious, right? We, uh, you know, uh, we must turn away from it. Right? Verse 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now I'm sure all of us know this verse, right? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Right? Now, for the for the Jews, the temple is a holy place. Right? Uh, the Jews they know okay, the temple of God uh, for in their mind would be the outer court, the inner court, the most holy place, the place of offering, with the place in the most holy place where God Himself, the presence of God Himself is there. Um, and what about the uh, Gentiles? The maybe the uh, local Corinthians who are living there. For them, the temple also, for them, they, they must have thought a, a place of, uh, you know, a place of worship, right? It may not have been holy, but it's a place of worship. So Paul is trying to get all of them to understand by saying that where you are, you as a person inside you, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, right? So you're not your own. Um, the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. God is dwelling inside us. And if God is dwelling inside us, how can we define, you know, and desecrate or dirty God's temple? We can't do that. Right? So you see how wonderfully the Apostle Paul is painting a picture for the believers in the church of Corinth, right? He's saying, you're a temple. The Holy Spirit is in you. So how can you involve in that? Right? Um, so he's telling them we're no longer our own. We've been purchased by God, and we cannot give ourselves away to any other. Right? So, how can we overcome sexual sin? Right? Uh, maybe some of us may say, "I, I, I'm not, uh, you know, overcome by. I, I'm not, you know, riddled with sexual sin. It doesn't matter to me." Praise God for that. But if there are some of us who are, uh, you know, still struggling with this, here are some truths on how we can overcome, right, uh, sexual sin. And here, it's all here in these verses, right? In verse, chapter 6, verse 11, he says, I've been washed, sanctified, and justified, right, that is made righteous in Jesus' name by the Spirit of God. So we tell ourselves, hey, I'm washed. I'm made holy, I'm sanctified by the Spirit of God. So I cannot, you know, fall into this. I live by what God, by what pleases God and not by popular opinion. What was the popular opinion in Corinth? It's all right to involve in uh, prostitution. But here, Paul is saying, we live by what pleases God. People may do it. People may be involved in it, but you do what is right in God's eyes. Right? And we tell ourselves that my body is not for sexual sin, but my body is the Lord's, and the Lord is for is for my body. Right. So we as believers can consecrate our our body to God. Right. And 
uh, who can say, I am spiritually one with Jesus. He is in me. I am in, I am in him. Right? Now, this is powerful. Imagine, we are spiritually one with Jesus. Jesus is in me. I am in Jesus. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples? I am in the Father and the Father is in me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So basically, Jesus is saying, if I'm, in, I'm one with Jesus, Jesus is living inside me. So I don't live out of my own, just like how Jesus did not live out of his own. He said, uh, I always do what my father reveals and asks me to do. Same way, we always do what the Lord Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, wants us to do. And then we run away, we flee from sexual sin. We say, God, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and I'm not going to fall into this trap. My body is not mine. My spirit, soul, and body has been brought by the blood of Jesus. And when the more we declare all of these, the more we will be able to overcome these temptations. Right. So I want to encourage you, each one of you. If, if not, if it's not only sexual immorality, it could be different kinds of temptations. All of these are are declarations that we can make. I, I'm sure none of us can say we've not been tempted, right? Uh, but here's the uh, encouraging part, right? The Holy Spirit inside us helps us to overcome the temptations of the flesh. Our flesh is weak, right? We are weak as human beings. But the Holy Spirit, Jesus inside us, will enable us to overcome all of this. So Paul is writing all of this. You see here, he's talking out of grace. You don't see condemnation here, right? He's talking out of grace. He's saying, remember who you are. Right? It's more of a plea. It's more of a request, an exhortation. And he's telling the church, this is who you are. And this is your identity. So walk with this identity. Right? He's giving them these practical tips on how they can overcome sexual immorality and sins of the flesh. Right, so with that, we conclude chapter six. And now in chapter seven, Paul addresses questions that were already sent to him uh, uh, regarding, again, he's talking about sexual fulfillment within the marriage, singleness, right? In this whole chapter, he talks about what it is to be married, what it is to for two believers to be married, what it is when one person is a believer and the other, uh, person is an unbeliever in a marriage and what it is to be uh, single, right? And uh, how, no matter what we are, whether we are married, whether we're single, whether we are widowed, whether we're divorced, whatever it is, uh, our primary objective is to serve God with focus, right? So this chapter, I'm going to briefly summarize uh, and you'll be learning more on uh, on all of this uh, in marriage and family, and you have learned it already. So we'll briefly look at a couple of verses, the important verses. We'll talk about that, and we'll see if we can move on quickly as well, right? So he starts off with the importance of sex within a marriage, right? So he's talking about sexual relationship. He says, uh, uh, you know, Verse 2, he says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and each woman have her own husband. Right? So to put it uh, in a shorter, succinct way, Paul is saying, in order to avoid sexual immorality, get married. Right? He's telling the believers, to avoid all of this, you get married. But he goes on later to say, just because uh, you know you're married does not mean the enemy is going to say, "Okay, you're married, so I'm not going to bring temptations now." Right? This does not mean that sex is the only reason to get married as well. Right? So we know that marriage is uh, is an institution. It's 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 for affection. It's uh, uh, to render and to give her to him, him or her what is needed in a marriage. Right? It's not just okay. Uh, just because I want to, uh, you know, I don't want to live a sexually immoral life. Let me get married. That's the wrong uh, intention, right? 
uh, we need to get married with the intention that God has designed it firstly, and marriage is good. And three, uh, it is to love, to cherish, to show affection. And so it's not just that one reason, right? Uh, if you look at the times that we are living in now, um, you know, we see marriage as a means of, you know, just uh, just getting, you know, I know of this uh, couple uh, many, many years back, and uh, they wanted to get married because one of them was, you know, uh, traveling to another nation or another country. And, you know, for the visa, so, you know, they wanted to get married and then they decided to get married. And after going to their, uh, to uh, the other country, they would, you know, just part ways. You know, and maybe there are plenty of other reasons why people get married nowadays. It may not be for love, maybe it's property issues, maybe it's for uh, just to be known that you're married, uh, just for a protection. Right, yeah, you know, and sometimes just for companionship, right? Just because I want to know some, just want to be with that person. Uh, there's no love, there's no affection, uh, and these are wrong intentions of uh, getting married, right? Uh, and then he goes on verse six. He says, "Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time." So, what does it mean? As husband and wife, they need to, uh, you know, together as husband and wife, they must live in oneness with unity with love showing affection care to one another but there will be times paul is saying uh you know don't deprive one another but there will be times you will have to you know take a step back in the sense you may abstain from physical intimacy why because you know you may be talking about uh, it may be because of fasting and prayer uh you know uh, there are uh, maybe you know uh, you've decided okay i want to do 40 days of fasting and prayer so you can abstain from physical intimacy from that time and during that period now it's not dishonoring in the eyes of god right uh, we must see it as a way that you are saying god i'm dedicating this time for you uh, but after that time it is very important as married people uh, to be intimate with one another right now this topic may be quite uh, you know intimidating or some of us may feel uh, you know it's uh, not comfortable but it's true right the reason we we talk about this is because many 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 times right maybe some of us are youth here eventually you will get married uh, and there are many times you know we've spoken to people they've got married and they have lost the concept of marriage right? uh, that's why in apc what we do is you know, when a couple wants to get married they have six months of training right? any picture that's six months they need to let us know in six six months trial that they want to get married and then there's a pre-marital course right when we talk about these things you know india as a nation when you think about sex and all of these things, it's very cliche. People don't want to talk about it, right? Uh, but here Paul is openly talking about it. He's not even married, right? And through the wisdom of God, he's writing and he's saying, it's married people, this is what's right for God, right? So remember, marriage is good. Sexual relationships within marriage is good in the eyes of God. It's not wrong. Right? Because sometimes people say, think that, hey, I'm defiling my body. No, you're not. It's not. Right? If you're within the design of marriage, it is pleasing in God's eyes. Right? So these are important things. There are many times, you know, there are couples who come up to us and uh, said, you know, these are the problems we are facing. Right? We we don't feel affection for one another. We don't uh, uh, you know speak to each other. We don't you know there are couples uh, who have said uh, we don't even talk to each other. We're just there together, right? Just because we got married, we're there together, and uh, you know the father is busy looking after the work and providing for the house. The wife is busy looking after the children and making sure the things are there in the house. That's it. Uh, 
and there's an emptiness. That's not what God has designed marriage for. It's a, a marriage is for joy and happiness, fulfillment, care, affection. So Paul is writing that to the believers here, right? Uh, right. Now he goes on from verse seven, chapter seven, verse seven. Of this. He says about the gift of singleness. Right now, we know that Apostle Paul himself was not married. Right. So let's see what he says about this. Right now. Some of them think, okay, being single is the best thing we can do. Right? We can serve God, no problem of, you know, all these you know, uh, husband or wife and children and, you know, looking after them, sending them to school and going through all these difficulties. Just be single, be happy, do God's work, God will be pleased. Right? Sounds good, but let's see what Apostle Paul says. Right? For I wish that all men were even as myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to you, to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Very clearly, the Apostle Paul is saying. Right? Uh, Saying, I wish that everyone were like me, but he's saying it's a gift given by God to certain people, right? Uh, it's not something given to everyone, it's a gift, right? Now, when we say gift, is the Greek word charisma, which means the gift of grace, right? Uh, see, Paul is. Uh, he, he wishes, he's saying, I wish all of them were single and could do the work of the ministry and spend all their effort and time in the ministry. But why is he saying this? Because in ancient Jewish tradition, it was considered a sin for a man to be unmarried. Now, he was not carrying, uh, saying there, right? He was not carrying out the intent of God to to be fruitful and to multiply. So Paul is definitely breaking away from tradition here. And the reason as explained is so that the person who's single can focus fully on the Lord. Now I want to be careful. If some of us really feel that God has called me to be single all my life, good. If God has called you for that, if you feel that you have the gift to stay single and do God's work for the rest of your life, it's a wonderful gift that God has given us. But verse 9 is very, very important. If they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. Now, there's no point in saying you know, I want to do ministry focus only on the Lord so I don't want to get married, have children. But while you're living this single life, being consumed with passion, right? being consumed with this uh, feeling of want to be with a man or a woman or the person with the opposite sex. right? So here are some examples of misapplications Right, meaning how we must not interpret this verse. Right? We must not use this text to condone sexual sins and uncleanness. Right? So I cannot say, I cannot exercise self-control. I'm burning with sexual desires. I'm not married. Therefore, I can indulge. Now, there's a word for that. That's called fornication. Right? I can't say, OK, I'm not married. I'm not accountable to anybody. I, uh, I'm not married. I'm not uh, involved with, uh, you know, I'm not one with another person yet. So I can do whatever I want. That's wrong. Right? Uh, Paul doesn't do that. Right? He's saying be single uh, to focus on the Lord, but this is not the excuse that we can use. Right? Second, is how we must not interpret the scripture. A person who is in bondage to sexual sin should not think of getting married so that they will get away from this, you know, uh, or they can come away from these bondages just by getting married. 
marriage is not a solution for sexual immorality or sexual desires. Marriage is not the solution. Right? So for example, if somebody is living a sinful life, always you know, or maybe a single person, always living a sinful life, and, he, and there's you know some kind of guilt, the person cannot say, okay, let me get married so I will avoid all these sexual sins. Because even after getting married, that can continue on. Right? But what the person must do is must say, God, forgive me for my sins. Change me, make me a new person, help me to overcome these temptations. And then look at marriage. Right? Uh, because you know this is very serious. We cannot look at marriage as a solution to avoid our sexual uh, problems or desires. You know? It's not a solution. We need to straighten ourselves up. We need to ask God for repentance. Make sure that we know our identity, that we are the you know, uh, temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is in us and we are in Him. And then we can go ahead. Because right? what we're doing is we're just going to have a failed marriage. We're going to put the other person in shame and probably even destroy the other person's life. Right? So singleness is a gift from God. Yet we must be assured that even if we are trying to live a single life, that our focus must be the Lord. And we don't make these excuses while we live a single life. Right? So any questions on this? It's important that we understand this. Any questions? Uh, anybody has any questions? Okay, no questions. All right. So let's continue. Sorry? There's a question? Sorry, I, I, I didn't check my... Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't see those questions. How do I preach these to a po polygams, family, or a person? Okay. Kennedy, I do understand that uh, you know, the continent of Africa has uh, you know, a lot of uh, these you know, questions that are coming. And um, Now, one of the things that we can do is just straight, straight preach from this, you know, uh, these two verses, five, six, seven. We can talk about these. Uh, maybe you can, you know, just uh, like what we've been discussing, we can talk to them and tell them, see, this is what God has designed marriage for, right? So you talk to them about marriage first, right? What is marriage? What is God's design for marriage, right? And then you can talk to them about sexual immorality. So it will take time, uh, but you need to go in detail, right? So firstly, if it's a married couple, you talk to them about the God's design for marriage. You go back to the Old Testament, right? You, 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 you show them from the scripture that God is pleased with marriage. There's nothing wrong, right? And you talk to them about how uh, you know, uh, ma sex within the marriage is all right, right? And how, you know, all that we've been talking about, if we if we go away from that or we uh, define this whole uh, sanctity of marriage, this threefold cord, if we break it, it is going to, you know, uh, defile us. It's going to cause us to fall uh, in the eyes of God, right? Uh, maybe. Kennedy, you may speak to people who have already committed that. Right? Now, remember that God's hand is long enough to bring restoration. Right? Yes, he or she may have to go through the consequences of their wrong decisions, but God is a God whose heart is in restoring people. Right? So you can always tell them, hey, you know what? It looks like you know your actions have consequences. But you can always go back and ask God for forgiveness. God is willing to forgive you, and you know, uh, and also ask forgiveness to your partner and see if there can be a reconciliation done, right? Um, you can openly tell them that having two husbands or two wives, uh, polygamy, is completely out of God's design. Because God himself said a man and a woman together in marriage. 
It is God's design. So we can't take God's design and alter it for our own, uh, you know, to meet our own needs. So Kennedy, this is a sensitive topic, but it's a powerful topic and it's an important topic. So you can just boldly, you know, you, you bring out the truths of what is marriage and what is God's design for marriage, right? Um, you probably you can, you know, continue to read these verses, um, chapter five, chapter six, chapter seven. Also, Paul is talking later on in, uh, in the book of Timothy. Also, he he briefly shares the importance of uh, uh, marriage and all of that. So, can you know just bring it out in the right way without condemning them? Right? They may be already living in a polygamous uh, um, relationship. Uh, but you speak to them without condemnation, but you bring out the truth. Right? Bring out the truth of God's word. So uh, next question is, what is your take when one weaponize sex in a marriage? Okay, yes, that is completely wrong, right? Uh, you, we cannot use it as a weapon. Uh, so for those who are, uh, you know, just want to make this question as a context, Paul writes about it later on as well. Uh, we can't say, you know what, only if you work, or a, for example, a husband telling a wife, only if you work and earn money and uh, provide for the home as well, will we, we can be intimate with God, with, intimate with each other. Or only if you do this, or only if you provide so much, or, uh, you know, putting, uh, what do you call, conditions, using it as a weapon is completely wrong in marriage. Right? It is two people coming together in union, in agreement with one another. Right? So if any of the individuals are using it as a weapon, they need to, be, they need to stand corrected. Right? They need to stand corrected. The scriptures teach us that it is a, 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 a union of two individuals in unity, in affection, care, and love for one another. Right. So, Kennedy, this using uh, weaponizing it is wrong in the eyes of God, right? And it has to be brought forth, and it needs to be shared with the person. And I hope it answers your question. Yes. Okay. Um, let's just go back. Uh, we have about ten minutes more. Okay. So now, Paul is talking about, verse 10 onwards, he's talking about those who are staying in the marriage, right? Uh, verse 10, he says, now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to, to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. Now. Uh, when we look at Old Testament scriptures, we know that divorce is not God's design. Uh, in, in Malachi, he writes, I, I hate divorce. But in during the time of Moses, right, um, God permitted divorce. Right? Now, these commands are both for man and woman, husband and wife. Remember, God permitted, he did not command it. He, don't, he did not agree and say it is good. No, God said marriage is good, right? But here he's in, in the time of Moses, he permitted it. Why? Because people were, you know, during the time, during the time when the people of Israel came out of Egypt, uh, they were living in immorality, sexual immorality. The husband was probably, you know, involved with another woman. And here the woman, the wife is wondering, what should I do? No, there's no, there's nothing that this person is doing. My husband is not changing. He's just continuing to do the same thing. As, so what should I do? Right. Uh, and so Moses says to, uh, you know, to the people, if it is something that is sexual immorality, if it is something that uh, is... Uh, involved with sexual immorality, a husband can divorce a wife, or a wife can divorce a husband. 
Now, this is not God's design. Right? Because it says that, uh, you know, in Matthew 19, he's, he's quoting, Jesus is quoting and he's saying, uh, verse 5, he's saying, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So this is the, the, the original intent of marriage from the beginning, the two shall become one flesh. But because of the hardness of heart of the people of Israel, they said, no, I will do things my way. This man or woman has to deal with the way I am. This is how I am. I cannot change. I, uh, or I can't get along with that person. I, I, I found somebody who can make me happy. If she wants to be with me, let her be. Or if he wants to be with me, let her be. Uh, but I need to move on. Now, in these kinds of situations, God is saying, it's okay. I permitted that marriage to be uh, to end in a divorce. But God's desire is that that marriage be restored. Remember, God permitted it. Divorce is permitted. But it's a violation and an abandonment of a marriage covenant. Right? Marriage is a covenant, you know, uh, as, as pastors, we get to go to these wedding ceremonies and we are there solemnizing these weddings. It's a marriage covenant. It's such a beautiful time when two people commit to each other to spend the rest of their life with each other. There's a saying, right, in sickness and in health. In trials and difficulties and challenges, and the good times and the bad times to be together. That's what marriage is. Right? And so Paul is saying, oh, you know, I permit it only on these grounds. Right? Uh, now here it's interesting, Paul is saying, I am not the Lord. So he's he's saying, okay, this is not under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but with this is what I'm saying now is out of the wisdom. An understanding of what of who God is and his nature. So I'm writing from my own mind, from my own heart. You see the humility and the responsibility in which Paul is communicating. He's making it clear that it's a recommendation and it's not from the from the Holy Spirit himself, right? Yet uh, it is, you know, the Holy Spirit in his great wisdom has uh, allowed these scriptures to be here. In, in even in situations where the spouse is not a believer, the goal is to keep the battles together and seeing the life of the other spouse, of the believer, the other, you know, the spouse can uh, accept Jesus. Right? They become believers, and this has happened many, many times. Right? Where, uh, uh, you know, husband and wife, maybe the husband or the wife, one of them is an unbeliever. Uh, but just because of the life of the seeing the life of the believer, the spouse changes them. You know, they give their life to Christ. Now, uh, this is again very important, right? Just because this is a possibility. Now, I should not say, okay, I like this boy or I like this girl, but he or she is an unbeliever. So I get married and then I live this. Like I live like Jesus only, and not get angry. I will, you know, I will go to church every day. I will do everything, and then when this person, the spouse, sees my sees my life, they will accept God. Now this is wrong, right? Uh, you know, it does not mean that the other person automatically receives salvation. No, we know that the Bible teaches us that we are to not to be unequally yoked. With one another right so we must be careful we can't say that okay uh, i'm a believer but i like this person uh, even though she's an un he or she's an unbeliever i'll get married and my life will speak no. what is happening initially itself we are breaking the covenant and the design of god but okay let's take a break 10 minutes we'll come back and continue from here